Okay. So we're, we'll get started in just a minute or two. Just wanted you to know that the recording is now on, uh, on Facebook Live. And uh, hopefully uh, many people will be able to see it. Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Shavua Tov. I hope you had a lovely Shabbat and uh, everyone is going to be able to get outside, if not during our interview. If you're not watching it on your portable device, then at least get out sometime during the day because the weather here in Toronto is beautiful. And I'm sure it's that way in Buffalo as well, just a, a couple hours drive south of us. We have two very distinguished scholars with us today. Um, this is uh, speaking to you now is Daniel Karapkin from the Bayit. Many of you know who I am, but I wanted to introduce you to our two distinguished scholars who are members of the Jewish community. Both of these scholars are Orthodox Jews, um, uh, and I'll introduce Professor Diana Zatterer first. Um, Diana Roberts Zatterer holds a PhD in religion and Jewish studies from the University of Toronto. She is the author of Metaphor and Imagination in Medieval Jewish Thought, Moses Ibn Ezra, Judah Halevi, Moses Maimonides, and Shem Tov Ibn Falakwera. That's the, the last one interests me the most, um, which was published in 2019. She has previously worked as a radio documentary producer, journalist, and Shoah Foundation interviewer. So welcome, Professor Zatterer. And just let me know how you'd like me to refer to you during our discussion. Diana. Okay, Diana, you got it. Um, and welcome to Professor Alexander Green, who was a visiting associate professor at SUNY University at Buffalo in the Department of Jewish Thought, where he also serves as Buffalo Community Jewish Educator. His research is on medieval and early modern Jewish philosophy, ethics, and the history of biblical interpretation. He is the author of two books, The Virtue Ethics of Levi Gersonides, published in 2016, and Power and Progress, Joseph Ibn Kaspi and the Meaning of History, published in 2019. He is also co-editing Jewish Virtue Ethics with Jeffrey Clausen and Alan Mittelman, an old friend of mine, which is forthcoming with SUNY Press. Welcome, Professor Green, and let me know how you'd like to be addressed. Alex is good. Okay, and Alex, it's good to see you again. Alex grew up at the Bayat. You were probably bar mitzvahed at the Bayat probably before my time, but it's uh, wonderful to be able to see your parents uh, uh, on a regular basis who are also my neighbors. So I uh, the, sort of everything aligned uh, uh, to be able to uh, secure the two of you in a, in a conversation today. Um, I had recently seen um, one of Alex's book reviews about a book that was published by Diana. And I said, I didn't know that uh, Diana had published this work. It looks fascinating. It's a book on imagination. Um, uh, of uh, th that is discussed by our Rishonim, by our medievalists. Uh, and I figured, well, why don't I get the both of you on? Because I know both of you, you're both from our community. And let's talk about it. And let's expand the conversation, not just to talk about the specific books that you've written, but let's open this up for a general audience. The two of you have chosen to pursue a particular niche of Jewish studies, and that is medieval Jewish thought. And for some people, that's like dusty, musty, old stuff, um, which may not really speak to us today in the modern world. And one of the things that I wanted to engage with the both of you today is why? Like, wh what is the, the interest? Why do I love medieval Jewish studies? And so uh, perhaps if I could start with uh, Diana and ask you to open up the conversation with that overarching question in mind, tell us what you're working on and how you got, you know, you obviously started this. This was not your uh, pursuit when you were first going to university. You went back to school and this, and you, you consciously decided to make this your area of focus. Tell us why and, and, and what you've been working on and, and what you're currently working on as well. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a real honor and pleasure to be here. Um, so I went back to university 
just with the um, idea that I wanted to complete a few courses. I had a bachelor um, way back when, and I just wanted to complete some courses. And so I went back to university and I started studying a few things. Um, and one thing led to the other. And eventually I, I took some, I, I actually took some courses with Sharon Green on Hebrew poetry. And um, Sharon is Alex's mother for anyone who's interested. And Ken Green is Alex's father. Ken Green is a is a uh, university professor at U of T as well. He is, he teaches both Maimonides studies and modern philosophy as well. Um, he, his latest book is on Fa Emil Fackenheim, as a matter of fact. Some of you may remember that we did an interview with him last year. Sorry to interrupt, Diane. No problem. So through the years, I had also um, audited a course with Ken. And so I, I had a love of philosophy and I had a love of poetry. Um, so anyway, I took courses and one thing led to the other. Um, the opportunity came up to take a master's. Why not? I did a master's. Um, while I was doing the master's, I studied with Nicholas Delange and that's where I met Alex. And he was a visiting professor from England. He had He's actually a translator of Amos Oz and um, Aleph Beit Yehoshua, who died last week. Um, but he was teaching a course on Hebrew literature of the Middle Ages. So I took it, knowing nothing about it, and learned that in the Middle Ages, there was a robust um, outpouring of Hebrew poetry and literature. The Hebrew language was being rediscovered and utilized for literature and poetry. Um, and that was fascinating to me. I, I had no idea. I had a classical Jewish education. I went to Olpana. Um, you know, I, I knew the classical Tanakh and, and, and you know, Rishonim and some of the Achronim. I didn't know anything about that so-called dark ages, which were bracketed by um, before that classes, classical literature and classical philosophy and modern humanistic literature and philosophy. But there was a, a, a period in there that was, and they call it the dark ages for good reason, because nobody knows anything about it. So that's why it's so dark. Um, but it wasn't at all. So many things were happening. There was such a flourishing of, of philosophy and inquiry and, and, it was wonderful. So that led me to a um, to studying um, that. And then I went on to do a PhD at the University of Toronto. And I found, thank God, the perfect opportunity to marry my interest in philosophy and literature by studying metaphor and imagination in medieval Jewish thought. Okay, and that's was that your doctoral thesis? This book that we um, yes that we published yes, and so uh, give us an idea. You know, um, metaphor and imagination in Jewish thought. Uh, wh what does that really mean? What is that all about? So, when you do a, a doctorate, there has to be a central, overarching question that you want to study, and my question was. Studying the Rambam, particularly in Mora Nebuchim, in the guide, there is an emphasis on rational thought and intellect. And that's the highest form of knowledge, trying to um, move beyond the, the, the sensory person that you are and pe become pure intellect. And through pure intellect, hopefully, we try to achieve some sort of union with the divine, whatever that means. And that's a very complex topic. Well, being an embodied person, I was wondering, well, how is that even possible? How, how, how is that even an ideal for a human being to even try to achieve? There has to be, there has, there has to be a, there has to be some way to, to understand who we are. Well, the medieval thinkers were, they were very, very advanced. And that's another reason why I fell in love with them because um, 
they were, I would say, the they they were somewhat neuropsychologists, not in the way that we understand today, but they try to understand how the human brain works and they compartmentalize the brain into different compartments. And some of them are the senses and some of them are, you know, in, entail memory. And one of them in one of them is a sense of imagination. And I try to understand what is the sense of imagination, because if you read through the guide, imagination is very much vilified. It's a yes. sense that we are not supposed to fall prey to the imagination and to imaginings. And so I wanted to understand what exactly that means. And I went back to the Arabic because the guide was written in Judeo-Arabic, which is Arabic the Arabic language in Hebrew letters. And I went back with, with a lot of difficulty, but I went and I studied some Arabic and I studied with some Muslim um, students and I tried to get, to get them to help me understand these. The Arabic language is, if you think Hebrew dikduk is difficult, just try learning Arabic. There are way Arabic, more. Yeah. Hebrew, <laughs> Hebrew has seven binyanim. Arabic, I believe, has at least 15. Yeah. And and anytime I would always laugh with my my teachers, anytime you learn a rule, it can be broken. So mm. all bets are off. So anyway, I I discerned that the way that the Rumbum uses imagination is is because we know that the Rumbum, he never wasted a word. He was very, very careful with how he wrote. He, he talked about different types of imagination. There is false imagination and there is the imagination that can lead you eventually, it's a stepping stone towards rational thinking. So through this careful analysis that I did of looking at the Arabic and also discerning these, um, the, these, um, very, very careful uh, threading out of the meanings of the word. I, I tried to show in my book that, that, that the, the attitude towards imagination shifts in Maimonides thinking from something that is um, God-given, we all have it, um, Adam Harishon had it, um, and it's something that we have to try to use, but we also, in an ideal world, overcome the false imaginings that our sensory, um, human, bodily senses present to us. When I uh, when I read the um, synopsis of your book in uh, in Alex's uh, review, it brought back uh, the memory of a book that I had uh, that I had read just not that long ago called "The Texture of the Divine: Imagination in Medieval Islamic and Jewish Thought" by Aaron Hughes, who's also a Canadian professor. Um, and um, what we're dealing with is a very Aristotelian idea. In other words, this whole concept of imagination as being a faculty, a separate faculty of our mind, because the mind has multiple different like faculties or sections to it that we utilize and pure intellect is supposed to be removed from the images that we conjure as you as you mentioned and we're not supposed to be misled by those images and so this um th this whole idea really requires us to plug into aristotelian systems which are very very foreign to the modern thinker but based on your research it seems like you've discovered that the imagination is also the faculty of the mind that creates art and creates poetry. And so perhaps uh, someone who's purely Maimonidean, who sees the world in monochromatic tones and sees things more black and white, the imagination is not something that is a useful faculty. But there are many other medieval thinkers that Hughes and I imagine you yourself also document, such as Rebbe Huda Halevi and such as uh, Avicenna, who look at the imagination as a vehicle, like to conjure images and poetry and art in your mind, to uh, recreate the heavens and to portray some kind of divine system in, in the celestial realm is something that can actually be a vehicle to bring someone to an even holier 
uh, religious experience. And I guess that's what you're trying to present, right? Absolutely. And the, the, those rabbis that wrote poetry, they were rabbis. They were learned. They were using images in their poetry that we might be familiar with today through tefillah. Some of them, not all of them. There are other images that they use that today could be viewed as problematic. Um, there was love imagery. Things that we are familiar with somewhat through reading Shir Hashirim. However, they would spin that into complete poems. And there was some of the poetry that they wrote was for the purposes of holy, um, sacred um, learning or, or reading. But there was an awful lot of poetry that was purely secular. And that's another reason why I became so fascinated with this period, because um, Professor Delange, he was teaching us secular poetry. And I was flabbergasted. What are these rabbis? Yehuda Halevi, Shmuel Hanagid, um, uh, and some of the others. What were they doing writing poetry that celebrates female beauty or um, just wine, the drinking of wine and, and, and where it leads to? This just completely shocked me and wanted me to understand that would be scandalous. That would be a scandal in today's world if a rabbi. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, so, some have suggested that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi wrote his poetry uh, that was what, what you call secular in nature, or perhaps, perhaps uh, descriptive of in certain uh, aesthetic indulgences in this world. He wrote that earlier in life, and perhaps uh, he may have had remorse about that. What, what What do you think about that? I I think that that's a very modern explanation for. I, I don't really, Ra, Yehuda Halevi, um, he, there are some very, very good uh, biographies written about him. And apparently um, he, was, he was a celebrity. He was actually a celebrity in his time. He was invited to Egypt to, to speak poetry, to participate in those wine parties. Um, you know, part of the poetry that he wrote about being on a ship and almost drowning happened when he was invited to other Jewish communities as a speaker. So I, I, I don't think that that's um, really what happened. <laughs> okay. All right. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to come back to you, Diana. There's so much to, to unpack in this discussion, but I want to go to, uh, to our friend Alex uh, for just a minute. And Alex, uh, you, as, as Diana was saying before we started, you, you're quite prolific. You're uh, uh, in, 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 in the, when did, you st when did you receive your PhD? How many years ago? I, did, I got my PhD in 2013. And, so, and, uh, yeah, and you're, you're still a, a relatively young uh, uh, husband and father and you have a beautiful family and, and you've accomplished a tremendous amount. Tell us about your area of focus in, in your studies and, and, uh, and also tell us a little bit about what you're doing for the Buffalo Jewish community. I'm sure. fascinated about that also. I thought you were going to ask me, how do I find time to write with three kids running around the house, which is a challenge, but, yeah, uh, right. but I've managed to put out some good work in between uh, having fun with the kids and uh, they're giving me a nice tribute on Father's Day. But and this is also- They are wonderful kids. They have, and they have, they have your and Karen's red hair also. And if they knew you were here, they'd, they'd want to come ask for a candy right now. But uh, okay. luckily, they don't know. Uh, so yeah, but, but let me get to, to my academic interest and uh, talk of answer your question, you know, why I love medieval Jewish studies. Uh, you know, I think medieval Jewish studies, medieval Jewish thought is the, you know, the angle that I focus on really answers some of the basic human questions. Uh, my work is on the ethics and medieval Jewish philosophy. So I sort of come at it from that angle. And I think the medieval's answer uh, and many of the great questions that people are still asking today, questions of happiness. What is the meaning of happiness, eudaimonia? So let me take a step back. My, I coming at medieval Jewish philosophy in dialogue with, I think, one of, one of the great works of ancient philosophy, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. And uh, sort of part of why I, I got into this was I was interested in how did Jews read the Nicomachean Ethics? And we know the Rambam 
you know, talks is was influenced by it in the Shmonet Prakim, even though he doesn't say it stated explicitly there. He does it reading it through, through some Islamic philosophers and you know in other parts of the Mishnah Torah. And what one of the questions I was sort of thinking about initially when I was you know when I was uh, putting my PhD together was I don't think the Rambam can't be the only one who read Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. It's cited throughout medieval Jewish thought as well. Let me let, let me ask you. Let me stop you right there. First of all, if you can tell the uninitiated, those who haven't really studied Aristotle that much. What is Nicomachean ethics all about, and what, sure. what, is the, what does the name mean? Yeah, um, it's, uh, it's well, we think it's written for his son in that sense, but it's it's really it's it's uh, Nicomachus, but it's all about an eth an ethics that is character based, character development. Thank you. I should take a step back before I jump into the medievals, which is it's an ethics that's character based. It's all about character development. How do you fix your character traits? And Aristotle is one of the first to make the argument that the ideal form of character is that in the mean, that in the middle, and that the extremes are negative. If you're at the extremes of character, you're going to live a life that's uh, more harmful to yourself and to society around you. So he advocates that character development. He's, one, I'm, he's not the only one to argue for character development. He's perhaps wrote one of the most famous works. So a lot of his work is dealing with character. Uh, it's dealing with the question of what's the good life, like what's happiness? What, and that, what's was, that was the term you used called eudaimonia? Eudaimonia. What's the life? Really, happiness is not the best term. Really, it's the life of flourishing. What's the best way to live? Uh, and he he asked that question, and it's a work that still has is compelling. And you know, is a life that deals with action or contemplation is an important tension within the work. Is it a life of doing or thinking or or both? Uh, and one of the central pinnacles of the work is the question of friendship. It's a question of you know how human beings socialize with each other. And uh, Aristotle famously says in that work. If you have friendship, you don't need justice. In other words, if everyone was friends with each other, we wouldn't need laws and courts and the police mm -hmm. and everything like that. Right. So there's a lot of important discussions there. And this was a work that, if I'm, if you're okay, I jump back, back into the medieval, uh, sure. that medieval Jewish readers were reading and thinking about uh, not just the Rambam, even though he had a large influence, but it was translated to Hebrew uh, and uh, it was translated once through Averroes, through an important Islamic philosopher, and it was then translated later. And if you look throughout medieval Jewish thinkers, they were all sort of engaging with this, with Aristotle's character ethics. They're asking, how does Aristotle's character ethics reconcilable with the Torah? What, now, were, were these medievalists engaging with Aristotle directly, or were they doing it through the lens of Islamic writers? So it's a good question. Uh, it depends who were, no, yeah, so no one was reading it in the Greek. I should just put that as an important uh, point. No one was reading it in the original Greek. Uh, some were reading it through the lens. Yeah, the, most of them were reading it through either certain Islamic philosophers like Al-Farabi or uh, Averroes. Uh, and sometimes in earlier periods, it was in the Arabic. And then later it was through Hebrew translations of these uh, Islamic commentaries. Uh, and then there was an initiative eventually to try, once Christians became very interested in the Nicomachean ethics, which was a little bit later in the medieval period, uh, they were, there were attempts to translate it from the Latin uh, so there were other Hebrew versions that that came about later as well. Uh, the reason I ask that is because I think I think it was Lawrence Kaplan, uh, another scholar, who suggested that when the Rambam, in his introduction to his commentary on Pirkei Avot, known as the Shemona Prakim, says that um, he's borrowing um, some ideas that come from non-Jewish sources, he had not only Aristotle in mind but Muhammad al-Farabi, who really sort of filtered. What Aristotle was saying in the in the uh, Nicomachean Ethics. Yes, no, I'm I'm in agreement, and I think there's a few scholars, uh, Herbert Davidson uh, and uh, there's Lawrence Berman, who have shown that if you look at the Shmon Ephraim, it's actually very similar to uh, one of Al Farabi's work called Fusul Al Madani, uh, Aphorisms of a Statesman. So he was influenced by that. Uh, I'm not saying he's doing the exact same thing, but there was definitely he was he was act he was thinking about Aristotle's ideas through this Islamic philosopher Al Farabi, who he he highly praises in one of his letters, his famous letter to uh, Shmuel Ibn Tibon, he praises Al Farabi as, as very highly. Like you have to read him of all the philosophers. And this is also something. I mean, you know, uh, Diana had mentioned the so to speak scandalous idea of rabbis being engaged in secular pursuits of art and poetry. Um, it's uh, perhaps even more scandalous to suggest that a rabbi is deeply influenced philosophically and religiously by people outside of the Jewish faith. W would you not agree? Yeah, and I mean, I think he says at the beginning of the Shemona Prakim, uh, he doesn't tell, he says he's not telling you where he's getting all of his sources from, but he, he has that famous line, which is accept the truth from wherever you find it. 
and you know you can take that line however you want but it seems that he was suggesting that he was reading widely and he didn't you know but but these ideas are relevant for judaism at the same time and, and, and i and i think he even says in shimona prakim correct me if i'm wrong that the reason why he's uh, plagiarizing without giving attribution is because he knows that his readership would reject some of the ideas if they knew that they did not come from authentic Jewish sources, which means that, you know, times for the Rambam, you know, from back then, it was also controversial to, let's say, read something from a secular source and then repackage it, so to speak, within a Jewish framework, right? Definitely. Yeah, no, definitely. He was aware of that problem that, uh, reading sources from outside the Jewish tradition could get him in trouble. And uh, he was very careful about not stating, giving all of his footnotes, which if you did in a modern academic paper, you didn't give your footnotes, you know, you wouldn't do very well. But in the medieval period, great rabbis like the Rambam could do that. Although it is interesting, he wrote the Mishnah commentary as a young man, and perhaps he felt he needed to be more guarded because of his reputation. By the time he's at towards the end of his life, and he's wrote the guide, um, he has no inhibitions whatsoever about talking about Aristotle and Al-Farabi and Ibn Baja and, uh, and, and Avicenna and all of the influences that, uh, that have, um, you know, influenced his thinking about certain ideas about intellect and, and, and the service of the divine and so forth. So perhaps he evolved in that respect and basically came to a point in his life where he said, I don't care anymore, you know, I'm just going to put it all out there. Truth is truth. Yeah, you're right. In the, in the guide, he's, he's given you many of his sources. So it's not all, even, even in the guide, he doesn't give you all of his sources. I mean, that's why that famous essay at the beginning of the penis translation, uh, where Shlomo Pines has a, has a the, I forget what it's called, the uh, philosophic sources, where he gives a list of the different sources that you wouldn't even often be aware of that Maimonides is drawing on. So it's very helpful yes. often to look yeah. at that and see where, you know, he doesn't tell you when he's influenced by Ibn Baja or Avicenna. Sometimes he'll mention things, other times... You know he's influenced and doesn't doesn't say it right okay now and so you so you said that you you've come to this from the standpoint of 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 ethics medieval ethics um many people you know modernists and postmodernists have said that you know the period of aristotle is passe i, I I'm, I'm reminded of this book that i read a few years ago called uh, after virtue by alistair mcintyre are you, are you familiar with this work alex I think you read my mind because I was going to talk about that as well. Okay, well, yeah. Uh, so why don't you please, if you wouldn't, if you'd go in that direction, because it's a fat. It was published in 1981. I have an edition that was published that was republished it with a new uh, preface about 20 years okay. after that. And if you could just give us the idea behind that and why it's because really what I want to draw out is why this is relevant to the modern Jew and the modern human being in general. Yeah. Um, when I and here I'll, I'll be a bit biographical because Diana gave a great biography of her her intellectual journey. But uh, no, I can just say when I when I got started my PhD, my my advisor, Professor David Novak, uh, really pushed me and said you have to read medieval Jewish thought in dialogue with contemporary virtue ethics. And one of the first works he asked, he suggested I read was Alistair McIntyre's After Virtue, and it is a wonderful. Work. It's a work that uh, that Rabbi Jonathan Sachs highly cites. If you look it up on the Tradition website. You can uh, see a little description of his engagement with that work as well. And what part, one of the claims McIntyre is making is that there's a relevancy to Aristotle's ethics, even though we can't accept his meta, what he calls his metaphysical biology. In other words, we don't believe in Aristotelian science today. Because many people will just say, you know, why do I need all this Arist Aristotle old stuff? Because we've, we've already rejected Aristotle's science. We don't believe the earth is the center of the universe. We don't necessarily, we don't accept all of his teleology, this idea of the four causes and the sort of, in the universe. We don't accept his idea of motion. He has many state, Aristotle's many negative statements on women. You know, we're not going to, and slavery, we're not going to accept everything Aristotle wrote, it seems to be from a an era. And one of the claims McIntyre makes, and I think it makes it very powerfully, he's not, not the only one, but I think he, his book really made a big impact, is that Aristotle's ethics still has a certain relevance. And he shows that there's been a continual debate about the virtues throughout time, that virtues are necessary for different communities to survive. And that virtues, uh, there's many different, there's been a what we call tradition of the virtues, and that if you look at different thinkers throughout history, this is not even medieval, uh, they have different conceptions of what character and the virtues are. He talks about Jane Austen, he talks about Benjamin Franklin, and you know, and Aristotle, and showing that 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 virtue as a development of character still has a relevancy, even if the science, the Aristotelian 
physics and metaphysics is not going to, we're not going to take that seriously today. And I think right. And I, and he, I think he also says that um, um, modernists and postmodernists have sort of mangled or sort of distorted the message over the course of centuries, and which is what not, not only caused them to reject Aristotle, but also to come up with an ethics system, which is deeply flawed. Yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a critic, and he does this in the early chapters, a critic of the ethics of the Enlightenment. And he argues that it leads to certain, I hope I'm getting the phrase right, intractable moral disagreements. That's a fancier way of saying that there's certain moral issues that we just can't solve today because you know you have people on different sides and they have no way of reconciling their disagreements. So one side's going to take one position, they'll take another position, and they just, you know, it seems very contemporary at that point, that you have no way for them to come to any agreement. And he argues that tradition is a better way for, as a concept, a better way for, for a system to look at ideas outside of it and then think about how to engage with those ideas. All right. And, and your, your work uh, is virtue ethics of the, the, um, the Ralbag, Levi Gersonides, and then your later work is on uh, Joseph Ibn Kaspi. Tell us a little bit about those two works and how they relate to this overarching idea of um, looking back to medieval ethics to find a greater semblance of a, of, of a, of a cohesive structure of morality and ethics. Well, I, so what I was what I'm trying to figure out is how did different Jewish thinkers after Maimonides deal with ethics and the ethics of character? And what were they thinking? Uh, it's not just the Rambam, but there's an entire tradition of character-based ethics that continue, continues after the Rambam. And this is in engagement with Arist Arist this work, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, as they knew as Sefer Hamidot. So what I discovered when I started looking at it, I found the Ralbag, and I, what I discovered is he has this entire section in his Torah commentary, the Torah at the end of every Parsha, that he derives ethical lessons from that Parsha. And uh, he, he takes the narrative side of the Torah very seriously. He thinks the narrative can be read uh, independently as a source for ethical wisdom. And what I, what I derived whether it was that I tried to sort of put this together into a system. I think that he has two different ethical models is what I talk about in the book. Ethic uh, or certain virtues, I should go back to the term virtues, virtues of self-preservation and altruistic virtues. He, he tries to, he makes the case that human beings are affected by luck or chance. And uh, it is the requirement of them to pursue certain virtues that allow them or that, that enable them to overcome the forces of luck as predetermined by the stars and he reads and, he, and many of the biblical characters that he's you know, interpreting are cultivating these different virtues that you don't find in the Rambam and they don't really so virtues what I call hishtalut what, I'm not sure to say I call but that what he refers to is hishtalut and charitzut endeavor and diligence and these are virtues that are focused on the needs of the body their needs of survival almost in a Darwinian way, that, that human beings have to focus on survival as their primary good. On the other hand, he also has certain altruistic virtues, and he believes this is an imitation of God, that uh, chesed, chanina, and hatava, that these virtues are, are that just how God created the universe in loving kindness. Uh, human beings have to imitate God's loving kindness. Uh, there's, I mean, precedent for this before Ral Bug, but he's interpreting it in a certain way. And there's also a certain chanina and hatava, which is translated grace and beneficence, which are virtues of how you should act towards others in ways that not only is what they need, but what actually improves them beyond what they need. And the, he actually argues this is how God constructs nature. And, and he, if you look at his biological writings, he talks about how God constructs constructs nature in such a way that certain we have certain bio, parts of our human biology or animal biology, which are examples of God's chanina and hatava, and that humans have to do the same thing in their actions towards others. So there's a sort of a survivalistic ethics, and then there's an altruistic ethics. And then what I did, I took a step farther, further, and I said, Grisanides also believes in what I call moral conflict. He believes that, that, that it's not always clear what the right solution should be in making a decision, and therefore, he thinks biblical characters reckon, learn how to reconcile conflicting moral demands. It's not always clear how you act in a certain situation. And he, think, he thought there's three different goods that they had to reconcile. Physical self-preservation, peace, like shalom, and the commands of God. And it's not always clear how you have to reconcile those three. And it, this okay. really comes out clearly in the Abraham narrative. We can go further there, but... Uh, 
Oh, back okay, to great. You. And and your work on Joseph Ibn Kaspi, is it in the same direction based on the ethics of Ibn Kaspi? Tell us a little bit about his work on ethics. Yeah, so Ibn Kaspi, I took a little bit of a different angle. I, I was thinking about his philosophy of history. Uh, Ibn Kaspi is a very colorful character, lived also at the same time as Grisanides in the late 13th and early 14th century. He was a uh, he was a commentator on the Torah. He wrote, wrote com two commentaries on Maimonides' Guide of the Perplexed. He was also very interested in Hebrew language uh, and in uh, Aristotle's logic. And he, uh, he what, what I was interested in was how he read the Torah in such a way to think about historical development. And I argue that he had two different models of history that were operating simultaneously. One, which is a history that is almost secular, that is uh, that where nations are in competition with each other. He thinks this is one of the secrets of the Torah. And there's also another form of history, what I call the progressive form of history, which is the, the fact that over time, the secrets of the divine chariot, which is, he argues, one of the great secrets, you know, from preceding, those preceding him, is one of the great secrets of the Torah is being revealed more over time. What we call the Misa, the Misa Merkava. Right? Exactly. Okay. And uh, he, he argues that it's actually done through the Hebrew language itself. I think this is one of the fascinating elements of his approach, which is he argues that through different structural elements of the Torah, and even really through the Hebrew language, uh, they, the, uh, the Torah is, is revealing more and more. And this is and it's part of, he's doing this partially in polemics with Christians as well. Uh, he's writing that you cannot translate Torah into another language because the structure of nature is built into the Hebrew language itself, into the roots themselves. So he has wow. a whole theory where if any root in the Torah, you find different words that are connected by the same roots, they have some kind of central meaning that connects them together. Now, I'm not suggesting this is, we would agree with this model, you know, modern Hebrew grammarians would, would, would agree with this, but he had this very philosophic model. So, you know, the word, you know, Aleph, Bet, Lamed, he would say the word Aval and Evel have some kind of connection to each other. Sure. The element of non-existence is one. And he, and he has an entire dictionary, which he calls Sharshot Kesef. Uh, all of his works have the word Kesef, little connected to Kaspi. And uh, he argues that uh, he, and he develops each, he goes through it word by word, and he shows how all the examples in the Torah, sorry, root by root, all the, all the different words that connect to different roots in the Torah are connected to some kind of conceptual scheme. Is and this part, is this is Sharshot Kesef readily available? I, I, I'm not familiar with it. There is a there's a critical edition being underway, being under works right now by a scholar in Israel who's working on it, uh, and uh, hopefully you can get snippets of it. I mean, you can look at the manuscript, like the you know the original manuscripts. But if you want to look at a modern edition, there's parts of it were published, but the full edition's underway by an Israeli scholar named Moshe Kahan who's who's working wow. on this now. All right, so a uh, fascinating that. Um, what Diana started with, which is her fascination with the Hebrew language and poetry, is what you're you're ending with now uh, and discussing, perhaps uh, on a more a technical analysis of the Hebrew language and the Sharashim, but still coming back to to language. I, I wanted to um, so first of all, I wanted to ask you a general, to both of you, general questions. Um, the first question I would want to ask you is that for the people who are listening to this conversation. For some people, this is very technical. This, like, oh my gosh, how can I even enter into a discussion of medieval studies? These people are like light years ahead of me. Uh, if if someone wanted to sort of uh, uh, get an entree into this world that for, you've been immersed in for for the last several years, how would you recommend that they get started? And and either one of you should feel comfortable answering the question. Please, please, uh, who would ever would Diana? Why don't you start us? Well, I I prepared a few books that I thought um, people might be interested in, and and they're at, at various levels of um, of where people are coming from. So um, there are some really good biographies of. Um, Maimonides and Yehuda Halevi that have been written. Yehuda Halevi's biography by a. a. Halkin, and um, then there's the Maimonides um, by Joel Kramer. This is an excellent biography. Um, it's 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 very excellent. There are and it's some of there are some biographies that are not very scholarly and they're sort of more you know storytelling. This is an excellent biography and it goes into some of his thought. Um, it if you want a general um, history of the 
period that I study. Um, there's Yom Tov Assis's Golden Age of Aragonese Jewelry. It talks about how um, communities were structured. Very, very interesting how the Jewish community took care of itself and took care of others within the community. Uh, I learned a lot from this history. Now, moving a little bit more into philosophy, um, there's one book in English and one book in Hebrew. Um, this is an excellent book, Yohanan Silman's Philosopher and Prophet. And this is a book about Judah Halevi, the Kuzari, and the evolution of his thought. Um, it's very well researched. It talks about the themes of the Kuzari. It talks about Yehuda Halevi. Um, and it, and it, it goes into the way medieval thinking was, uh, medieval philosophy. As Alex mentioned before, um, there's a whole system of medieval um, philosophy, metaphysics, and one of my bugaboos is when people read medieval philosophers like um, Yehuda Levi or, or Maimonides, and they don't understand that, yes, they were very, very steeped in Arabic Aristotelian thought, and that is, you cannot divorce that from what they wrote and how they thought. So right. another, this, another bugaboo uh, that, to use your term, which is a great word, um, um, is the idea of evolution of thought. Because that, that, that suggestion that uh, a great thinker like the Rambam may have evolved in his thinking from the time that he was, let's say 20 to the time that he was 80 is in itself controversial, right? W wouldn't you agree? I actually, I, um, I, I used Silman's book that you just held up, Diana, in, in translating the, the Kuzari and doing research on it. And, um, and when I brought a, a citation, a footnote from his book to, uh, to my publisher, which is a, an Orthodox Jewish publisher, they, it made them feel a little bit uncomfortable because to suggest that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, may, he wrote the Kuzari over the course of over 20 years, according to Silman, and to suggest that he may write something in one part that may be, have a slightly different nuance of idea uh, from a, something that he writes in another part may cause some level of discomfiture for the reader and from perhaps they felt even theologically it might be problematic. So um, it, it is quite interesting that you hold up that book as an important work and you talk about evolution. So I just, sorry, sorry, sorry for interrupting. Well, um, I think that we are as human beings living in communities and living within societies and the, the people in those days were traveling a lot they didn't get on airplanes, they got on boats, they traveled across land, they were going from Spain to the Middle East to North Africa, some, some were even trading in India, it's impossible to think that there were no influences upon human beings who are traveling throughout continents, and, and being exposed to different people staying in different people's homes and, or inns or wherever and not being um, somewhat, uh, um, maybe assimilation is too strong of a word. Um, there are other words that people talk about, which is acculturation, which, which I would say is the way we live today. We live within our Jewish culture. However, if you go to any wedding, and you say, oh, I heard that song on the radio in English. Um, that's acculturation, where <laughs> when, more, when a singer takes a song that you know on the radio and turns it and puts Hebrew words to it, he's, he's a sim or she, they are taking in the culture. But I just wanted one final book, and I think this also is a book for maybe a more advanced um, reader called Ben Hakuzari La Rambam. And this is by Yitzhak Shelat, and he takes um, themes in both of the thinkers and he examines them through their writings. It's a very well done book. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to use it very much because he doesn't talk about metaphor or imagination, but it was it's it has themes that they both address and how they address it. And he people tend to think that. Uh, um, like Menachem Kellner wrote a book and, and he, he says that, you know, Maimonides and, and, and um, um, Judah Halevi are completely different thinkers and, you know, 
on virtually every topic they they think differently well he brings a few more unifying um, themes in their in their writings right and obviously that's a nuanced discussion clearly there were differences but perhaps not as many you're suggesting or Shilat is suggesting as perhaps a professor Kellner would want to accentuate yes. okay so so those are some very good recommendations and what about the primary texts? What what texts would you recommend <laughs> for someone to start with if they want to just deep jump into something uh, that is really from the medieval period? Well, um, obviously, you have a wonderful translation of Yehud Halevi's Kuzari, um, and that's very good. And, and um, I really like the historical notes that you bring in the back and who the Khazars are and where are they from so that if somebody's more interested in history they can start with that and then they can read it through the translation if you're a Hebrew reader you can read it um Ibn Shmuel uh, I'm sorry I'm looking up at my book um wrote a Hebrew translation um so that's good now for the guide there's the classical penis um translation I had a lot of frustration with that tra translation. It's it's old. Mm. Let's face it, it's old. Um, there is a new translation that is in the works right now. And I, I'm always hearing that it's imminent. It's imminent. Right. Um, Philip Lieberman is working on it. And the other, um, who is the other one? Who's Len Goodman. Len Goodman, right. Um, they're working on it. They're down in Memphis. Um, at uh, Emory University, right? And uh, they're- Emory, Emory's in Atlanta. Uh, they're in oh, Nash sorry. Nashville. In, sorry, they're in Nashville, sorry about that. And they're working on a translation and it's going to be annotated. It's going to be very scholarly. I'm waiting with bated breath for that to come out. All right, um, hopefully hopefully for our grandchildren, uh, because you know, when, when people tell you that a translation is imminent, my experience tells me that uh, we may have to wait a long time. Uh, but we'll see, hopefully, inshallah, as they say. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's hope it comes out soon. Alex, what would you uh, what would you recommend? And by the way, thank you for the plug. That was uh, completely shameless of me to uh, to evoke that from you. <laughs> Al Alex, why don't you go ahead and Dan tell us? a wonderful job of a uh, good overview. I I'll just add to her uh, excellent overview. I don't want to repeat what you said. But uh, yeah, definitely in terms of getting into Well, let me just put up a, a great, if you're interested in Grisonides, well, bug, uh, a lot of the work is very sort of technical, but one sort of general introduction that makes it accessible, or at least you know more accessible, more accessible as, as one can be, is this book here by Seymour Feldman. You can get it on the screen here by uh, Grisonides, Judaism within the limits of reason. This came out about ten years ago, and he mm -hmm. does a pretty good overview. He goes different themes here about creation, attributes, providence, Torah, humanity and destiny, uh, the Torah. So this is a, a good overview of, uh, of Grisonides as a philosopher, as a thinker. Uh, it, I mean, if you want to look at his commentaries on the Torah uh, and in Hebrew, there's, uh, you know, Yeshivat Male Dumim has put out these critical editions of his commentary on Chumash and they're very accessible. They have great footnotes and uh, really easy to use. They've gone through all the manuscripts. So, you know, you feel these manuscripts, not that that matters to everyone, but, uh, they, it, but the footnotes are also very helpful when there's something ambiguous. Okay. I would just, I'll just build on what Diana was saying also just about uh, Maimonides. Yeah, I, I agree. The Joel Kramer biography is very, is a great place to start, I think, and to see different stages of his life and also sort of the culture that he was living in. Uh, and I mean, there's other great books. Uh, Micha Goodman, who was one of my teachers, has a, has a very accessible book if you're interested in sort of understanding sort of Maimonides' general philosophy. Uh, the guide, you know, I think it's in English, the, the book to change Jewish civilization or something. Right, from, right, right. I don't. I I used to have it right next to me. I don't have it right now, uh, right next to me. But yes, Micha Goodman's book on on the guide for the perplexed is an excellent resource. And Moshe Halbertal also has a great as a good yes. introduction. Both of these were yeah. my teachers at Hebrew University, so they're also great great speakers. And look on YouTube to watch some of their lectures. As and well. uh, Her Herbert Davidson was one of my teachers, <laughs> although he was already retired from UCLA when I went back to school. But uh, he also wrote a wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful mm. work on Maimonides. And there's there's just so much so much out there. There's just it's, sometimes it can be overwhelming. Um, I, I want to ask both of you uh, another question, and that is, uh, you know, Diana started with that when you work on a thesis, when you work on doing something for a PhD, you have to start with a question. And what I wanted to ask you is, um, 
invariably the things that we study, the things that we read, generally we are affected by and, and we are influenced and we are transformed by the things that we read, um, especially as people who are very devoted to our faith, uh, to, committed to our Yiddishkeit, but at the same time wish to take perhaps as we get older, we should take a more intellectual approach, a more mature approach to what Judaism is all about, what, what the basics of, of our faith are all about, and how we connect with Hashem. What I wanted to ask you is, um, not only perhaps a, a, a more basic question, um, w w did, do your studies uh, either enhance or detract from your basic faith in God and in Judaism? And how have you changed overall? Um, uh, in, in as a person, as as a Jew, as a servant of God, how how have your studies um, transformed you, or if, if at all? And if you could just reflect on that, and and as a way of sort of perhaps inspiring others who might feel that need to pursue this uh, uh, for themselves, as as part of the reason why they you 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 engaged in this exercise and. Did it meet your expectations? Where are you in your journey, and, and so forth and so on? So, if I could just ask both of you to to comment on that. Do you want to start? Or you want me to start? Go ahead, Alex. Do you want me to start? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I I let me think where to where to, where to begin here. Um, does, does it affect me? I think it definitely. You know, when you're sitting in shul, it gives a whole new, deeper way of 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 looking at the Torah. I mean, I, I know just even just with this week's parsha, there was so much. There's so many uh, deeper, I don't say deeper, philosophic ways of, of reading all kinds of elements in the Parsha that, you know, that, that one gets uh, when, when looking at it from these medieval philosophical approaches. Uh, I mean, I, I know I'm not going to go into all, but there's so many angles. One could just think last, just from, you know, just from yesterday, Shul. I would say that for me, I don't see intellect as a conflict with faith. I mean, I think that uh, the, two, the two, one only strengthens the other. I mean, it gives you greater passion. Greater, greater, greater ahava, to, you know, to use the Rambam's term at the beginning of Yilcho Yesodei Torah. So, you know, I, I see, you know, the academic study is only a way to, to, to engage more with the Jewish tradition and to feel more passionate about it and, uh, and uh, get into it more. I don't, I don't, I don't see it as in any way a conflict. Okay. And if someone were to challenge you and say, uh, doesn't this uh, conflict with your emuna pshuta, like your simple faith that we're supposed to, uh, you know, have with God and and not, you know, delve into these uh, uh, philosophical ideas? What would your response be be to that person? Yeah, I mean, I would say that this medieval Jewish philosophical tradition was definitely not a believer in just emuna pshuta. They were they were the idea that 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 faith requires a lot of effort, endeavor a lot of work and, uh, you know, a lot of thinking as well. Not that thinking's everything, but like there's, you know, a lot of it's, it's not, it doesn't just come through, through being there. You got to put the work into it. Maybe that connects to my article I wrote a couple of years ago on courage. My motto is on courage, which is that there's, a, there's an element of boldness uh, in Torah, which I think he thought uh, that it's not just doing things. It's about challenging. It's about not just intellectual courage, achieving new heights, overcoming Fear, fear, and uh, you know, being bold in the way we think of Torah. Thank you. And Diana, how about yourself? Well, as I told you before, I had a very classical yeshiva type of education. However, a, a yeshiva for a girl type of education. Um, so there, for me, there's a lot of frustration that I do not have Talmud on the tip of my fingers. I have Tanakh but I don't have Talmud, like the, the, the study of Gemara. So that is something that um, is personally frustrating for me. Um, but I, I constantly try to work on it. I keep on trying. But um, I'm, I'm, to be very honest, there are things that you study in university that they didn't teach you in Hebrew school. And there is a little bit of a hiknak shoot. You know, you have to have sometimes work with it. Um, thank God, I come from a very strong religious modern Zionist background. I, my, my parents have emunah pshuta. I was raised in a home with that. Um, I, I believe that God is um, helping me in the world. I, I have a constant dialogue in my head with God. Um, so that has not been affected, thank 
thank good thank god <laughs> um but there there are things that you study that that um that then can rattle you a little bit that can rattle the way you, but as alex said um what i the, the beautiful thing about the the medieval thinkers is it was all about inquiry and that's another thing that I love, the intellectual curiosity. They did not shy away from questions. They didn't say, ah, oh, shush still. No, don't ask that. No, they asked questions. Maybe the, some of the questions were a little different than our questions. You know, they did, they're, 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 there really wasn't atheism in their time. Sure, there were probably people who, you know, didn't struggle, but pretty much historically everybody was within a faith group whether it was christian muslim jewish so there wasn't room for that so we have much more difficult challenges today um and so do our children and and the society is very different but they were people too they had issues they had struggles and they had open minds to ask questions about these struggles and that's another thing that i love about it and 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 i love and, and i think it's wonderful to emulate that and to have an issue and to have a question and to work it through in your mind and to work it through by looking at the sources and the more sources that you know about and the more the more you understand how they thought the greater your emuna can become Beautiful, beautifully stated. I, I I always come back to that story in Parshat Vayishlach about Yaakov's wrestling match with uh, with the angel, which in many ways is descriptive of that struggle that you've described. It says in Pirkei Avot, "Behevi mit abak va'afar aglehem," um, which is to cling to the dust of their feet. But the word mit abak is the same word that the Torah uses when it talks about the wrestling match between Yaakov and the angel, which therefore can mean that the mission is saying, don't just um, passively sit at their feet, but wrestle with them, wrestle with the words of the sages, wrestle with the Torah, and don't be satisfied until you arrive at reconciliation. And that's, that's part of the, for me, I agree with you, that's part of the beauty of these medieval studies, is that even when they're, they are working with perhaps um, uh, outdated science, like Alex had made reference to, you know, as far as Aristotelian physics and metaphysics or, or anatomy. Um, uh, but nonetheless, you see their methodology is to struggle and to not reject something simply because it comes from a source that's secular, but rather to say, perhaps that wisdom is God-given as much as the Torah is as well. And maybe there are, the answers are out there and I can incorporate that to enhance my Judaism instead of shunning the outside world. Uh, I just, you know, we're, we're coming up on the hour and I don't want to take up more of your time, but I just want to thank you. I, I could probably, we could probably continue this uh, for two or three or four or five more parts, but um, I want to thank you for the contributions that you've made to Jewish literature and to, and to scholarship. Um, and uh, just the best wishes for Chazak Vematz, continued Hatzlacha in everything that you're doing. And we look forward to future, future efforts uh, and future scholarship from both of you. Thank you very much. So to thank Diana Roberts-Adderer and to uh, Alex Green, we thank you. And thanks for joining us on this Sunday morning. And thanks everyone for listening. It's a pleasure thank to be you. here. Okay, everyone. So take care. Shavuot Tov again. We'll hopefully see you for the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.